I pick them and I put them straight into water when I'm picking them. And then I come in and I put the kettle on. I don't let the hellebore see what I'm doing. <laughs> and I pour about an inch of boiling water into a mug, freshly snip the ends and plunge them into the water for 10, 12 seconds. I sort of look out of the window and try to pretend I'm not torturing the hellebore. We're talking to Derry Watkins about Lord Anson's pea, that little atheris that I wanted to grow. And so I've got the seed of it. Mine's germinated. <gasps> Good mine. <laughs> Hello and welcome to a little bonus postbag edition of Talking Dirty. Over at East Ruston Old Vicarage with a backdrop of a marvellous magnolia, we have delightful Indonesian Alan Edward Herbert Gray, our happy and very handsome horticulturalist. Well, good morning. And uh, over in Cambridgeshire, we have Thordis Maria Sophia Friedrichsen beaming on this wonderful sunny morning. You look absolutely lovely. Thank you. I've gone for red. I'm wearing Mickey sure. Mouse and rainbows and it's sunny. <laughs> My oh, look, 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 I have to show you this because I'm actually wearing money. <laughs> <laughs> He's covered in money. Never has Alan Gray worn a more suitable top. Um, <laughs> I'm just joyful because my seedlings finally seem to be kind of happy at the moment. It, it's like the hokey pokey in my house with my limited resources, bringing them in, putting them out, like watching them, checking the temperature. So I finally feel like today there's it's quite a good temperature. It's quite a good light level. They're happy. And that's made me happy. Well, you know, you came to see me the other day and we, we I gave you some pots of um, a seedling, Honesty, and there's an Honesty called Ched Glow. And you have to grow these Honesties in separate patches of the garden, or I do anyway, because to keep them um, true to their type, because otherwise they crossbreed and, and they muck everything up. And Ched Glow is rather a lovely one with deep, deep purple flowers. And it's got this lovely purple foliage or cast to the foliage as well. Well, I put all those seedlings out a couple of nights ago and I thought I'm going to find a shelter spot, which I did. And you know, even here on the coast, we've had the odd frost or two and I went just to look at them just before I started this podcast I'm so pleased to say they are looking absolutely wonderful but it is amazing you know uh, this you have to know in your mind which seedlings you can put out um, and normally they're the kind of things that they'd be germinating or self-germinating in the garden now um, I put my uh, Ched Glow under cold glass to try and hurry it along a bit and, and I have to say the seedlings that I gave you are much more forward than the ones that are still in the garden so that did work but you can't do it with everything but do be careful if you're putting seedlings out and if you can just think, find something a piece of fleece or a piece of sacking or something to just to put over the tops just to give them a little bit of shelter the other thing that we do here is where we've got a little bit of tree cover we use that and uh, quite often I mean the things like um <sighs> Dixonia, is it Dixonia? I don't know. Um, one of the tender tree ferns anyway, I put that under the cover of branches and that's all I do, but that's enough to keep it, you know, keep it safe through the winter. But it's just using what you've got around you really. And for us more amateur gardeners, um, I think it's also worth noting that it's kind of extremes of temperature and you can worry about them getting too cold, but then what I've found with some of my seedlings is I've gone outside and thought, it's really cold, I'm gonna put a cloche over them. But then if you don't keep a really close eye on the sunshine, it, obviously that's a small area, it heats up really quickly and that can do more damage in some respects than the cold. So it is a bit of a, a balancing act and you've got to really keep your eye on the ball. You have, but I think the answer to that is and I had this with a question from one of the girls that worked for me the other day. She said, oh, look, all these plants here are far too dry. And I just said to her, yes, but uh, Jenny, that's better for them to be too dry than too wet. Mm. Because too wet and, you know, they, it encourages rotting and all the rest of it. And, and you, can, you can actually kill a plant by overwatering it. But if they're on the dry side and they wilt a little bit in the sun, and as you said, just said, the sun behind glass today is quite fierce. Um, they will wilt a little bit, but that, that won't hurt them. But it's, it's better to be too dry than too wet. Can what I ask, I know this is technically supposed to be a postbag edition, but there are a few things we want to talk about before we get on to the questions. Um, with seedlings, obviously, what, what a lot of people have said to me is, oh, my seedlings are really leggy this year because we've had to grow more in slightly you know, imperfect conditions because it being so cold, even during the day. Um, and I know that 
with some things, you can just plant them deeper if they get a bit etiolated. I mean, obviously not so leggy that they're flopping over, but if they get a bit leggy, you can plant them deeper to make up for it. Is there some sort of rule around what that works for and what it doesn't? Do you just need to experiment? Um, yes, you do. You probably will need to experiment to a certain degree. I mean, I would say use your eyes because if you, I mean, you and I walking around the garden last summer, we saw a cosmos that had flopped on its side and the, the crown had popped up again to, into the upright position and where the stem was touching the ground, it produced, produced um, adventitious roots. So there you are. It will root from a lower down the stem. That, that tells you what happens. Tomatoes will do a similar sort of thing. But you all always have the danger of, of rot because that stem tissue is quite soft. And if it starts to rot, well, you've lost your plant. I mean, the, the, I say it again and again and again. I've got packets of seeds sitting on my potting shed bench. They wink at me every day, but I, I ignore them because, you know, um, my granny always used to say, look, don't worry about sowing your seed too early. Plants will catch up. And, and to a certain extent, they do. Um, but just bear in mind that the earlier you have zinnias in flower, the earlier they will finish. And so you might get to the end of August where you've got nothing in your garden. And then you go, mm, <laughs> because you have nothing in your garden. But, I mean, you know, have your seedlings that are early but don't worry because you can sow hardy annual seeds right up until the end of may into the first two weeks of june and you'll still get flowers at the end of the season somebody sent us a um a, 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 a lif lyf i'm trying to go nigella seeds yes. indoors you know and they're looking a little bit etiolated and and very pale she said i wonder if i've given them too much sun and i think i think it's probably due to the lack of good light to be quite honest, um, on a windowsill, it's not ideal. Somebody, you know, sometimes we haven't got anywhere else to sow them. But why don't you wait, Liv, and sow them outside? There'll be time to sow them outside until the end of May. Um, that's what they prefer. They prefer to germinate at their own, you know, they don't want fussing in, on a windowsill or anything. Um, so, and to recognize the seedlings, the seedlings have fluffy little fern-like foliage. I mean, they're pretty little things. You can see immediately which your, which your seedlings are, but I would wait and just sow them direct when you get a chance and make sure, I mean, now is a classic time. Uh, what was it, six weeks ago, we were swimming and everywhere in the garden was swimming. You know, it's Wellington boots, spludge, spludge, spludge. Now, of course, we've been dry for weeks and weeks and can you believe it, we're watering? Mm. Um, because you have to, I mean, newly planted areas of garden, we're watering. Um, and that's one thing I would say about your seedlings. If you're sowing seedlings, make sure that you give them a jolly good watering now and then. Yeah, and of course, it, it's so easy to feel like you're planting in spring. It's a really good time. You don't need to water as much, but it has been so bone dry. I mean, I live in this very clay area and I go walking out in the fence and the ground looks like the middle of a drought in summer it's all cracked yeah. so that's how the climate has changed though hasn't it because I mean that you know do you remember the old sort of rhyme and January brings the snow that makes your feet and fingers glow February brings the rain that free, that thaws the frozen lake again March winds April showers may come your way and all those <laughs> we haven't had a shower in, it's the middle of April we haven't had a shower you know so we don't get our predictable temp uh, weather patterns anymore. So it's very, very difficult. Yeah. So, you know, you've got to get out there and watch it. Um, just going back to seedlings before we leave that part of the conversation, um, you were talking about sowing things in situ. Of course, there are lots of plants that will really resent being sown in any kind of seed tray and then transplanted. Things like uh, Californian poppies, the Schultzias, they much prefer to grow where, you know, sow the seed where you want them to grow. They hate root disturbance. There's a trick to that. <laughs> I thought there would be. <laughs> no, there is a little trick to that in actual fact, and it, it's quite simple. Um, we did it with annual poppies, first of all. We, we have done it with the Schultzes too, and it does work. Um, and it, it, the trick is that you buy one of those little seed module trays where you've got like little egg cups and you fill it full of soil and you press it down and you scatter your seed very thinly over the top. And I just put a little co covering of... Um, What's it called now? That inert stuff. Vermiculite. That's the one. Thank you very much. <laughs> or the other one as well. Perlite. Um, and <laughs> vermiculite is the yeah. one that I like to use. I have to say, uh, because that lets light through, and the seedlings, if they're growing outside, they'd naturally have light on them anyway. Um, and when you 
when the seedlings germinate, don't be in a hurry to do anything with them. Leave them until they fill that little module full of roots. And you can push your, push your finger at the bottom and you can extract the whole root ball as a, a single unit. Then you can plant them either straight out into the garden or into larger pots if you want to, uh, to grow them on a bit. But that's how we did poppies last year. We did the um, Beth's pink poppy, that pink poppy that Beth Chateau used to grow that Fergus Garrett um, has champ championed. Um, we, we did that and we do it with the ladybird poppy and we do it with some of the ordinary poppies like Amazing Grey and things like that. And it works very, very well. It also means that, you know, if you're sowing your seedlings direct into the soil outside, they have an awful lot of competition from weeds and there will always be weeds. And then you worry about whether you've got the weeds out or am I going to damage the seedlings and all the rest of it. Well, it means you can give a head start because you can actually clear your ground where you're going to plant your your homegrown seedlings in their modules you make it all nice no weeds and you can plot them in give them a jolly good watering and they will be a little bit ahead of any weed seeds that do germinate oh he's just so full of all the great advice <laughs> so glad i brought that up it's logic really isn't it? <laughs> in actual fact i think if if one tends to think um and it's your mindset if you tart if you think now, how's the best way to go about this? And you think, well, if I do that, if I do it, make it easy on yourself. That's what I would say. And if you if you think along those lines, make it easy on yourself, you'll get there. Yeah, I definitely haven't done that. I tried really hard to wait and be patient, but we all know it's not one of my great gifts. <laughs> um, so I only... know. It's not one of mine either. I know what you mean. <laughs> I only sowed a few things. And I, I, I did also try to germinate. I, I sowed things that said they had quite long germination times yeah and you know if you wanted something to grow quickly it would take twice as long as it says on the seed packet I wanted them to take as long as it said you know 14 to 21 days perfect it'll be warmer by then three seven days up <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> I, I tried to be clever and it failed much like the rest of the time now, yeah. the other thing we want to talk about before we get through all of our questions is an exciting project you've been undertaking with some alpine troughs, Alan. Well, yes, I, I've, I've had I've got alpine troughs scattered throughout the garden and, and um, I, I try to group them together in areas where you have more than one to look at. And we've got about three areas of them at the, at the moment and I had um, six troughs in the bottom of the sunk garden or rose garden um, and they'd been very neglected for many years and I hadn't done anything with them um, and I had a rather exciting order that came in um, of alpine plants and there were two nurseries I would recommend for people if they want to buy alpine plants. One is Potterton's Nursery and I think they're in North Lincolnshire somewhere and Darcy and Everest um, and they, I think they're in Cambridgeshire in actual fact, um, both of which offer an excellent mail order service and both of which are amazingly reasonable price-wise. Um, and I had some wonderful plants from, I mean, from Darcy and Everest, I had some plants and the, they, they arrived rather chunkled, I'm afraid. The courier had messed them up and I took photograph and I sent it back to Darcy and Everest and say, look, this is what's happened. He said, all right, discount that lot. Here's a code, reorder when you're ready and you get it for nothing. <laughs> so he absorbed that cost. And I have to say this because it's a very honorable thing to do. But we didn't worry too much about some of the things that were chunkle, but we rescued as many plants as we possibly could. And a good half of that order wasn't, um, didn't need to be thrown away. It could be used. And we have used them and that, you know, they're absolutely fine. So I emailed him back and I said, well, look, you know, this is what I've saved. I will have credit for what the ones I couldn't save. And that's what we've done. So I think that's worth mentioning. Uh, yes, yeah, so I've been planting up these alpine troughs. Well, you know, if you've got a trough and you want it to look like an alpine um, landscape, which is what I do. Um, first of all, you need to sort of think how you're going to do that. And I suppose the first thing is compost. And if you think about where alpines grow, they're up in, up in the mountains and things. The one thing they have is good drainage. Um, so you need to have very, very sharp drainage. The other thing that lots of alpines have, which sometimes people are not aware of, is because of where they are, higher up the mountain there is snow and that where there is snow there is snow melt so as the spring becomes into the summer the snow starts melting so beneath the alpine's roots are this is this continuous feed of water and there may not be any rain coming from above the the um the plant but there's all this water coming down the mountain sliding down from below um which is 
quite, I mean, you think of alpine meadows, for instance, that's why they are um, meadows and they're squidgy and ponds form and all the rest of it because of the springs and the, and also the snow melt coming down. So they, they, you've got to realize that they, these plants, you got to keep them watered. You, I mean, you can't not water them. So drainage is the first thing. So I mix up, um, we make a mixture of John in his number one or two, um, half and half with grit, um, I put a bit of homemade compost in there. I can't tell you exactly what I put it in because I, be, I mean, there is no formula to what I do. It's a handful of this and a handful of that, <laughs> depending on what I'm planting. But then I think about the trough and I think about how, to, how I'm going to make it look like a landscape. And you've got an area of trough, we'll say 60 centimetres by 60 centimetres, two foot by two foot, which is not very big. Just as a flat thing, it looks boring, dull. And I want it to look as if there's a Matterhorn in the middle. <laughs> now, what can I use for that? Well, years ago, I haven't bought any for many, many years, but years and years ago, I bought something called Tufa Rock. And Tufa Rock is like a form of pumice, pumice stone. It's exceedingly soft and it's a limestone rock and plants will weave their roots into it. And they'll actually grow through it and into the compost below and all the rest of it. And the one thing I've been doing is I've been cutting up my tufa rock, which you can do with an ordinary carpenter saw. You saw through it like you'd saw through a breeze block, get it into a shape, and then you knock it about a bit. And I was using a hori hori knife and a hammer to knock it about a bit. <laughs> and, and also to make planting pockets in it, which you can see um, in some of the pictures that I've, uh, I've taken. And in those, in those pictures, uh, in those pockets, I'm going to plant some of the choicer alpines, like some of the, um, the hard saxifrugs or saxifrages um, and some of the nice things. Um, and the, I think one of the things, another thing to think about when you're planting a trough is if you're putting a rock in the middle of it, you're going to have a sunny side and a shady side. And that's quite interesting because on the shady side, you can sort of make your pockets and you can grow gentians, uh, but they've got to be lime tolerant gentians. Um, and you can use um, things like little um, calciolarias, choice alpines. If you look through um, Darcy and Everest or Potterton's list, you'll find loads of these things. And I advise you, if you're looking through it, to, to have a search engine ready so you can actually check the plant because... They do have some fascinating things. So, yes, I've been doing that. And I've been making my little Matterhorn landscapes. And But it, I don't use just one piece of rock. Sometimes I'll use one piece of rock if I've got it. And at other times I've got three pieces that are not quite big enough, but put together and, you know, with a little bit art, of artistic license and jiggery-pokery, you can almost nail them together if you want, providing you cover up the nail heads. Um, and, you you know, you make your own landscape as you go, and then you start planting. And that's the stage I've got to. So the exciting bit is um, about to, to take place today when I finish this podcast. <laughs> Oh, you've got a beautiful day for it as well. I just yeah, might yeah. known because I have just inherited a little empty alpine trough. And yeah. um, if I'd known, I would have brought it over to you and then I could have left it for you to plant. <laughs> you could have done. That's exactly. And it would have exactly. been a lot better than if I plant it. <laughs> you know, alpine troughs, I, uh, if they're big enough, I like to have a selection of flowers in them that start and, and start in spring and they go through and all the rest of it. And one of the things I've found that is, I think it's a lower Aristra. No, I'm not quite sure. There's an alo, um, which we always grew as a houseplant years ago. It's not the partridge breasted one. It's a one that's got a scaly leaf to it. Um, we always grew it as a houseplant years ago. I've had it outside for years and years and years with sharp drainage and it flowers. And I've got that sort of sitting as a kind of an alien, if you like, in one of the troughs. And you, you can get things like a, a, on one end, I've got a weeping rosemary. Oh, I love and that. Planted on the edge of a trough and then it hangs down. If the trough is elevated and I've got mine on stands, then that hangs down. And it looks lovely. The other end and on another trough, I've got a darling little greeny white clematis that is tiny little thing and it just sort of weeps over the edge and you get these minuscule little irises now the season for my trough starts very early because um in the most sheltered places in january and february we've got miniature narcissi that are blooming uh, if you put them outside in and uh, you know in a, in a windy spot they're not going to last five minutes um but in a sheltered spot you, you know you get these lovely little harbingers of spring very very early and very early little species crocus of course i mean potterton's do a most wonderful range of species crocus um and you know there's not that many you won't get that many i mean you you and you only need to buy two or three um and some of the big on some of the prices you, you you'd have to think to yourself well i can't get them anywhere else this man this dedicated man rob potterton he grows them from seed um and you know it's just absolutely fantastic 
um, and you can have your pots, your troughs, looking wonderful the whole the whole year through. And there's nearly always a dwarf version of a plant that we're familiar with. Last year, I got a um, from Potterton's. I bought a um, a very very tiny growing fuchsia, and it's red and purple and it's flowering. It's just like an ordinary fuchsia, but it is a didmidot. It's like pygmy fuchsia. And there's also a pygmy um, silver birch. And there's also a pygmy, if you like that sort of thing, for Scythia. <laughs> and it's just, it, it, you know, it's like, like a natural bonsai. Um, <laughs> so there's all of these things to experiment with. And I think it's a lovely way of gardening if you haven't got huge amounts of space. Um, and if you're, if you're a little bit older than perhaps the average gardener and you find it difficult to you know, lug heavy things around, you might be much happier just studying and sitting amongst your alpines. Mm. And, and of course, like you raise yours up, so they're also easier to reach. <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. And it's easier to see the flowers because I think that's one of the things, um, you know, if you've got a tiny little flower and it's down on the ground, well, good God, I can't get down there again. <laughs> <laughs> so bring it up to eye level if you can, or as near as possible to. And uh, and I'm not sure they'd be your kind of thing, but whenever I go to a botanic garden or, you know, someone with a really fantastic rockery, it's all the little hummocky plants that I, I just can't get enough of them. They look like little cushions, and I don't know any of their names, but I think well, when I plant uh, mine up, I'll be after one. Yeah, there's a di Dinosia, I think, is one, and Saxifrage, of course, is another. There's a wonderful Saxifrage, which I've got. The one thing you have to be careful of with Saxifrage is the fact that the vine weaver loves to lay its eggs in, in Saxifrage crowns, and then, the you know, the young hatch and eat the roots. Um, but there's a Saxifrage called Tumbling Waters, and from this tiny little, fairly tight rosette with a, with a lime-encrusted edge to the petal, to the leaves, these huge panicles of flowers um, and mine are just starting to flower now. The panicles are coming up and their, their stems have got red bristles all the way along the stems and lovely little sprays of white flowers with red hearts. I mean, they are stunning, quite wonderful. And of course, lots of the auriculas that, um, you know, Jane Ann Walton, she grows this wonderful, wonderful auriculas, but some of the alpine auriculas you can grow in alpine troughs outside as well. Oh. Um, and, you know, you're putting them in their natural conditions, they love it. That's so exciting. And we are hoping to have Jane Ann. She did a wonderful podcast with us a few months ago, but we are, fingers crossed, going to do an auricular special when hers are all in bloom and we can enjoy their fantastic, exquisite flowers. So we can look forward to that in coming weeks. Um, and the one thing else about Jane Ann, she has the most amazing garden, the garden that suddenly produces something that she thought she'd lost many years ago. And it was a double violet. Did you see that the other day? Yes. I'm sure you did. Yeah. Um, even though she got it in the garden, and, you know, she thought she'd probably lost it. But there it was. And she showed it on the screen and it just looked so wonderful. She has lots of wonderful things as well that she got from Cottage Garden Society, seed swap. Yeah things that have crossed in her garden. I remember asking after a wonderful little Nicotiana, which had just self-seeded. So it was a cross between probably Tinkerbell and something else. So I've now got some Tinkerbell germinating in the hope that I could get that crossing with something and producing its own seedlings in my garden. It will happen. Fingers crossed. <laughs> I do hope so. Now, this was primarily supposed to be a postbag edition of the podcast because we've had several questions come in, but we never have time for questions in our normal podcast. So um, if you have got something you'd like to ask of Alan or our other experts, particularly, you know, if you if you know someone's coming on the podcast and you want to put a question to them, do flag it and we'll try to fit it in. But it seems that postbag editions are the best way to answer the questions. And there are multiple ways to ask. You can tweet us. Uh, at Get Gardening Now. You can comment on Instagram or message us there at Get Gardening Now. Hello at getgardeningnow.co.uk is our email address. And of course, you can comment on one of our YouTube videos. And that's the most popular way to get in touch. Now, we've answered uh, LYF's question about Nigella. How, how about one about a, kind of a different way of growing? Johnny had a question about cuttings. And I thought this was an excellent question. Why do you stick them around the edge of a container around the edge of a pot, which of course is something we all here to do. But what is the reason behind it, Alan? Or the reasons? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, there's, I think there's several reasons in actual fact. Um, first of all, I'd have to say that it's not absolutely necessary. You don't have to do it. It's the traditional way of people doing it. And I think it stems from the fact that people used to use years ago, terracotta or clay pots um, and terracotta and clay pots, they breathe. 
Um, and so you've got the air around where the root is going to form. Um, there's also the fact that, the, you know, terracotta absorbs moisture so the plant won't get too wet. Um, and when you're planting pots, uh, cuttings around the edge of a pot, you space them regularly. And that's the other important thing. So you don't, they don't all grow in entangled together quite so much. Um, and basically, I think that's just the reason for do it. That's the reason we do it. When I take my cuttings today, I don't do cuttings like that around the edge of the pot. And that's why I say it's not absolutely necessary because the cell trays I mentioned earlier in this podcast, I use those primarily to take cuttings with. And I fill them full of my cutting mixture. I give it a tap on the bench, bang it up and down to make it firm, give it a watering, leave it for an hour. And then I take my cuttings and I plant them with a pencil, making it uh, using a pencil as a dibber. And I clean the, the bottom of the stem, put it in some rooting hormone and plant it about an inch deep in the middle of each of those cell trays. So you don't have to be go around the edge. But I think the I think going around the edge of a pot has more to do with tradition and getting large numbers in the pot than anything else. And there are so many reasons I started looking this up and I just think I I mean, it's I was going to say it's still a good way to do it. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. I think everybody's got a different reason, whether it's drainage or it's warm around yeah. the edge of a pot or whatever there. Everyone has a different reason for doing it that way. But yeah, it's sort of the way we've yeah. always done it. And on the subject of rooting hormone, um, I certainly need to do this. If you've not refreshed your rooting hormone this season, always worth getting some nice, new, fresh rooting hormone. Well, I remember a quote from Christopher Lloyd years ago. He'd had, he'd had his rooting, it was a powder he was using. I use a liquid form today, or it's a gel really. Um, but he was, he was, he'd used a powder and he'd had it for years. And he said, he was quite parsimonious, you see. And so he, somebody said to him, you ought to renew that. And he said, there's nothing wrong with that. It's, all right. it's been all right for 10 years. It'll be all right for another 10 years <laughs> kind of thing. He said, but I did renew it. And he said, I have to say the results after I was using fresh rooting hormone powder was entirely different thing. I mean, plants rooted better, a greater proportion of the cuttings rooted and they rooted faster. So it does work. And basically what is a rooting hormone? Well, hormones are there to encourage the formation of roots, but it also contains something much more important, which is a fungicide. And fungicide stops rot or helps to prevent rot, I should say, um, which is one of the things we want to do because the taking of a cutting is a race and it's a race between that cutting rooting or rotting. Now, if you win the race, it roots. If you lose the race, it rots. <laughs> <laughs> Simple as that. So anything that you can use to help you to make your taking cuttings a success is wonderful. And I would say just grab it by the horns and just go for it. Now, another question from Graham. Now, Graham has planted a brown turkey fig in central Scotland. He put it against a slatted fence last autumn in soil, but with a wooden box frame to restrict the roots. Now, Graham has noticed the last 100 millimetres of the branches are slightly blackened. Is that a problem? And do you think Graham will get any fruit this year? Well, there's a question for you. Now, first of all, Graham, I'm going to say to you, who knows? I certainly don't. <laughs> But I mean, there is every possibility that the blackened ends to your fig, um, your, those branches could be frosted, depending on how mature they are. And I, didn't, I wouldn't do anything at this juncture at all. I mean, here we are in the middle of April and you're probably slightly behind us in Norfolk, in Scotland and in growth terms. But I would wait until your fig starts showing signs of new growth. And if it, show, if it shows signs of new growth right to the end of those stems, you've got nothing to worry about at all. But if the blackened stems do not show signs of new growth then you cut back to the I would go to the not the first pair of new buds but the second pair of new buds uh, beyond the frosted end and cut there and discard that piece and hopefully I'm not going to say it's definite but hopefully you might get fruit later on it's very difficult with figs to judge when and how you're going to get fruit and of course the further north you are um, in the middle of Scotland it's slightly more difficult um, still because the one thing that fruit uh, like figs adore is long hours of sunshine. And they're not going to get that as much as they get it in the south of England and higher temperatures too. Um, they're not going to get that as much in Scotland. So good luck, Graham. This is quite an embarrassing thing to admit. Um, but let's, let's just say there are no stupid questions or stupid admissions on this podcast. It's a safe space <laughs> for admitting things. Yeah, yeah, I, think, I think it is because, I mean, you know, um, the things that, People like me who are an experienced gardener, the things that we take for granted, we 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 shouldn't because 
we take for granted because we've been doing them for years and years and years. And to us, it's 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 second nature to do them. But the one thing is, is I would say to anybody, if you don't understand, please, please don't be afraid to ask. I mean, you might feel foolish asking it. I might feel foolish answering it. Who knows? <laughs> But ask it anyway, because we can have fun together and just enjoy ourselves. Well, I have a fig, on, you know, inspired by that sentiment. I have a fig and I put it in a pot. It's in my front garden in a really lovely sunny spot, but it is a bit windy, but it gets a lot of sunshine. It's sort of south east facing, but I can never get its watering right. I feel like it's either underwatered or overwatered. I never seem to strike this right balance. And I think the first year it was underwatered. Last year, I think I overwatered it. And I don't, I, yeah, it just seems to confound me and it never seems to be happy. Well, if you have a regular regime of watering, that, uh, that, that will help, I think. It doesn't mean to say uh, our, our regime of watering pots in the garden here at East Ruston is Monday, Wednesday and Friday. And then either Saturday or Sunday, if necessary. Um, but Monday, Wednesday and Friday are definite watering days. Um, but it doesn't mean that every pot gets watered. If a pot is very, very dry, it will get watered. Um, if it needs water, it will get watered. But if it's moist from the previous watering, it hasn't used up all that water. And you can tell that. You can often tell by tapping, uh, tapping a pot. If you tap, for instance, a terracotta pot, if it needs watering, it will ring. A slight ring to the, to the tone. If it doesn't, it'll be bub. A thud. Oh, you know, you get used to. And the other thing is picking a pot up. I mean, some of our containers I can't pick up; they're too this, big. So I can't. This is too that. big. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to be picking that up unless I want to go go to A and E afterwards. <laughs> Finger test is the ideal thing, isn't it? Stick your finger into the compost along the side of the pot. And if it's very, very dry, give it some water. And if it's if it's still a bit of moisture in there, leave it for a couple of days and then water it. And obviously we talk a lot with, you say, a normal orchard or if you're planting a tree in the garden, making sure it's got that clear ring around the bottom so it doesn't have competition. But because figs, we, we often talk about restricting them. I have underplanted mine a little bit in this pot because every bit of planting space in my garden is precious. So I tend to put little, not particularly vigorous things around the bottom of it. And I wondered if it was resenting that competition as well or whether figs were vigorous enough to put up with it. Um, I think if a fig was growing in the ground, it'd be vigorous, vigorous enough to put up with it. But I think if you've got it in uh, in a pot, I don't think I would put anything, any competition around it at all. I understand what, where you're coming from and what, you know, how you're doing that. But I mean, if you think of think of where a fig grows, it grows in the Middle East um, in very, very dry conditions. Now, that means to, that to get moisture and to get nutrients that fig has got to have a very questing rootstock which will go way 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 down um and i mean a very long way i'm not going to give you distances because i mean i couldn't be exact but a long way um which is why in this country if you don't restrict their roots they will go down and they'll think oh look at this lovely moisture this wonderful soil let's put on some leaves um ah, look it's more moisture more let's put some more leaves and more leaves and that's why until they get established um, or they get kind of shocked in a funny sort of way or neglected in a way. I mean, we, when I grew a fig in, when I was a boy, we had a courtyard and it had a, this gravel in this courtyard and the cars used to come and go through it and everything else. And there was a fig on the wall there and the gravel went right up to the roots of the fig. It didn't get any good soil or anything. And that, and that gravel actually was tarmac, tarmac underneath. So it was quite an impervious surface, if you see what I mean. But the fig grew like hell. I used to climb onto it as a child and sit in the branches and sway like a monkey up and down. <laughs> Um, eating eating the fruit and being careful not to get stung by wasps as they fed on the fruit as well. Um, but because the the it was restricted over its root stock, it fruited wonderfully well. But in the open ground, I think, I mean, I'm trying an experiment here in East Ruston. We've planted, I think, five or four or five figs in the open ground. I'm going to let stuff grow underneath them. I'm not going to keep them free of weeds or anything else. So they're going to have to fight to get, but they will go down. And I think for the first few years, they'll make an awful lot of leaf. But I'm hoping that in times to come, they will settle down to a kind of a regular fruiting regime as well. It won't probably be as good as it would in their natural habitat. Um, I mean, in the Middle East, they get two crops a year. Under glass here, we get two crops a year from figs, but we'll probably only get, still get one crop. But then who knows? We'll see how it goes. And I think the really interesting lesson in everything you just said for me is always, as a more amateur gardener, to remember the compromise you're putting a plant under by putting it in a pot. 
it's it's just nothing you can't compare it with being in the the, the ground you can do your best to make it happy but it's just not the same yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, you can keep a lemon or an orange tree in a pot and you can grow it in a pot, but it won't be like the tree that you see it growing outside. I mean, some of the most wonderful orange trees, I think, uh, in the in the in the greenhouse at Peckover House in. Um, yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, I mean they're absolutely fabulous. And they, they have to trim the tops because the tops are up to the top of the greenhouse. Um, but it's absolutely fabulous when you go in there and you look at these huge, great oranges. And I'm sure people steal them, but they're horrible to eat. <laughs> <laughs> for most people it's probably quite a trek to make it to Peckover because it's in in Wisbeach and that's not very close to most people but it, it's well worth it it's a it's a wonderful national trust place yes it, it, it's a lovely house a lovely setting and that little stretch of river um where the Peckover house is has some of the most wonderful Georgian architecture yeah, it's a wonderful really? stretch it's a beautiful view yeah. Mm, yeah. Next question, very seasonal one. Natalie has got some primroses in a pot. She's wondering, would you split them after their first season? Yes, I would, because I'm greedy. <laughs> <laughs> but I think no. If you're if you're a um, a fan of propagation, which I am, I love propagating plants. Um, and I've just done some actually, Natalie, because um, we have a, a very old a double purple uh, primrose called Quaker's Bonnet. We've also got a double white one as well. And the only way you can keep these going because they're sterile and they don't set seed. The only way you can keep them going is by division. Um, and technically you do it after they flowered, but I did it. When I, when I thought about it, because that maxim has gone in there from Christopher Lloyd, it's better to do a job when you think about it than not to do it ever. Um, so I did it when I was thinking about it. And I, I think from one clump, I got 20 plants. So I'll have 20 plump plants for next year. So yes, when your primroses are finished, I would take them up, out, out of the pot, um, split them individually. You can cut the old leaves off, um, just leave, leaving a, a few, little, few little stems a bit like that. Um, but cut the old leaves off, divide them up into in the individual crowns, pot them individually into something like seven centimetre pots in good compost, stand them outside somewhere cool, somewhere sheltered and somewhere shady and give them a jolly good watering and then just wait. And as soon as you see them making some new growth, don't let them dry out the times, but as soon as you see them making new growth, you know that you're onto a winner and you can watch them until the autumn um, and then when they're ready in the autumn, you can, you know, pot them up again into pots or put them in the garden itself. And, you know, be assured that you'll have a lovely display. One thing I would just say about polyanthus primroses um, and all of that tribe is that uh, taking a lesson from Sissinghurst, that wonderful garden in, in Kent, where Vita Sackville West and Harold Nicholson lived, they had a, a spring walk. They've still got the spring walk, but it was a polyanthus walk. And they had all these old fashioned polyanthus, which they divided every year and they potted and uh, replanted. And they, it was absolutely stunning. Um, and then the ground became polyanthus sick. So there was something in the ground that the poly, so that affected the growth of the polyanthus and primulus and they wouldn't grow. So do be aware of that. And to counteract that, when you're planting your primroses out, don't plant them in the same place. Vary the places so that you, you know, you, you get you planting them into fresh soil, which is unaffected. And if you do that, you should be absolutely fine. Incidentally, the spring walk at, at, at Sissinghurst now does not contain primulus and polyanthus, but it still looks fabulous. In fact, I think it probably looks even better. <laughs> we went for a walk uh, around Santon Downham and Santon Warren the other day, and there was just a roadside bank that someone had planted a few different primroses in. And they'd all been crossing and hybridising, and you got all those lovely mid pink and pale pink shades. And um, that is my real dream. One day I want a bank that's just got them all mixed up, all those lovely soft shades, apricots, and then the odd real hot pink in there. Um, yeah, that's on the wish list for a future garden. A little tip of that, because I mean, they might have other people doing things like this. I mean, you might have, for instance, a ditch going through your garden and you know how you walk around the countryside and you suddenly see a ditch and the whole bank is, is a curtain of primroses and you think, wouldn't it be lovely to have that? Well, you don't have to plant the whole ditch. You can do what I did. We had a ditch and I used to dam the ditch when I was a boy in our garden and I managed to make a pond at one end and we had um, we had water voles in this pond, which was absolutely thrilling to have. Um, but 
<clears throat> what I did is I planted the top with primroses and left them. And then as they shed their seed, the seed tumbled down the bank and, the, you know, the gradually, gradually. And I remember Christopher Lloyd telling me about his mother, Daisy, at Great Dixter. She planted uh, snake's head fritillaries along the top of a, a ditch. And she sa he said, and when the seeds popped, they just let out whoops of joy and tumbled down the bank. <clears throat> and that's why we have the whole ditch filled with snake's head fritillaries today. And I just thought, how you can just imagine a shed, a, a, a seed letting out whoops of joy. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. A little whooping fritillary. A um, couple more. Oh, just one more question then before we wrap things up or have a spot of flomo before we wrap things up. Tiz Tiziania took two epiphyllum cuttings. She says she took them about a week ago and hasn't added any water yet. When is it OK to water your epiphyllum cuttings? Well, we did a little film, didn't we, on how to take epiphyllum cuttings. But the great thing is where you've made your cuts or whether you've detached the leaf from the mother plant, you let that area callous over. It's got to be dry and it's got to be calloused. So I would, if I'm taking epiphyllum cuttings, I would take the cuttings on Monday and I would plant them in the compost on Friday, leaving them in the meantime to dry out so, because I want that area to be calloused. The reason for that is to stop the very fleshy leaves from rotting um, because if they've got a cover between the the... The, the flesh and the, the soil, that's absolutely fine. I would think that you've got to give them a good watering now, give them a, a watering, let the pot drain and look at it very, very carefully and do it about once a fortnight, I would think, uh, depending where you're keeping them. And I would keep them somewhere um, in a semi-shaded position because epiphyllums, you've got to remember, they grow in the shade of, a, of, of the rainforest and they are epiphytes that grow on the, on, in the, in the branch crooks of trees and things like that. So, um, yeah, make sure they keep them somewhere shady and sheltered and, of course, frost free. <laughs> now, just finally then on the podcast, FLOMO, which is that fear of missing out you get about some kind of fabulous plant that you want to grow. I'm going to go first because I always do. Alan always outdoes me. So <laughs> I'm going to make sure I get in there first. And also this week, it's not an unusual plant, but it is one I've wanted for a while. And I don't really know why I haven't got it yet. But Foggy, who's a great supporter of this podcast um, and posts some wonderful photos on her Instagram of the plant she's growing. She has uh, GM Mai Tai in her greenhouse at the moment in flower. And I just thought, oh, I love GMs and I don't really have any. I used to, I used to have them in my parents' garden. I haven't planted any here. Um, but G and Mai Tai, I mean, that is very much my colours. I love those sorts of oranges, pinky sunset shades. So that has definitely edged its way up the wish list. Well, I'm just scribbling here, actually. <laughs> <coughs> Something about gyms, because gyms, I mean, years ago, there was probably, uh, I think there was Mrs. Bradshaw, who was bright red, and Lady Strathedon, who was yellow. Um, and they had their early flowering summer, early summer flowering season. And then somebody got to work doing some a great deal of breeding work in them, and they and they they made some wonderful sunset colours of thunder, which you of course love. Um, and I brought a new one the other day. I can't quite remember its name, but it's a rosy, orangey pink. It came from Elizabeth McGregor, who does a range of gems that's very good. And of course, Rosie Hardy, um, she does a very good Hardy's Cottage Plants. They do a very good range of gems if, if people want to go into the into the realms of the new gems. And the great thing about these new gems is that they flower for a much longer period. And if you if you aid them by deadheading them when they were, you know, once a fortnight or something like that, go with the snips and just take the dead heads off. Wait until the whole flower, flowering stem is finished, then cut it back to the crown. That's the easy way to do it. Otherwise, you'd be snipping there forever. Um, <clears throat> you'll get an awful lot more flower. Um, but the, the race of gems that are available today are absolutely terrific. Wow. And it's funny, actually, you mentioned Hardy's. And I mean, they have that fantastically famous GM, Totally Tangerine. And it's, yeah. it's funny to think that... Chelsea for years now I feel like that plant is always everywhere rightly so probably in all the gardens because it's such a good doer and it's all these wonderful little points of orange that zing in wh whatever garden you're planting up but it's funny to think in a September Chelsea um, that, that hopefully the planting is all going to be very very different to what we've got used to over past years. I think it will be very different. Incidentally, I had a lovely present this morning from the Italian Terrace because Louise and Clive, who have been supplying us with wonderful flower pots, not, not I don't mean me, I mean the whole gardening fraternity, uh, lovely flower pots made at their pottery in, in Italy. 
um, for their for their nice customers. In other words, if you spend enough money, <laughs> they have reached the uh, the twenty five year milestone, and they sent everyone a little flower pot, a terracotta flower pot. Uh, you know, celebrating this occasion. It, was, it came this morning and I just emailed her back and I said, well, thank you so much for my present. It will go in the Pelly house with a suitable um, a suitable pelagonium sitting inside it to, to do it justice. In a letter that come to this flower pot this morning, Louise said to me, see you in September, which is the Chelsea Flower Show, um, um, if we can find, fl- you know, pots to, to flowers to fill our pots with. And I said, well, it's been mooted to me by listening to other people that, you know, one of the things that we're going to have this year is an entirely different Chelsea because of the seasonal variety. And I heard from Sarah Raven, the delightful Sarah Raven, the other day, yesterday, but I think it was, um, she was on Winifred Robinson's show um, on Radio 4, and she was talking about the next big plant. I mean, we've had dahlias, we've had this, and we had that. Well, if you think about the way our climate is going, our autumns are becoming much, much more benign and longer was a time when you you know you could cut off at the first two weeks in September we'd have frost and all the bedding would be finished not so anymore now it goes right the way through almost until Christmas um so the next big plant to look out for are chrysanthemums yes <laughs> <laughs> so I suggest I suggested to Louise that she, her and Clive looked towards filling their pots full of crazy colored chrysanthemums and coleus you know the, the yes. jazzy li- and I just suddenly thought that will knock them dead. Yeah. And that's what I, I mean, do that and it'll knock them dead. Um, it's just an idea in actual fact. But one thing that Sarah said, and that, you know, when you talk to people or they talk to you, you can usually learn something. And lots of people sort of probably think that chrysanthemums are not hardy. Well, some of them are not. Um, and it depends where you grow them, whether they're too cold, too wet, too dry, whatever. Um, if you leave the roots in the ground over the winter but there's one series series of plants and they are the tula t-u-l-a the tula series of chrysanthemums she has found at at perch hill to be uh, where she where she grows her plants to be as hardy if not hardier than many of the others so i thought that was a useful tip to bear in mind and of course you can get those plants from sarah's wonderful website yeah and uh, i mean we've been raving about chrysanthemums for years on the radio we've talked about them on this podcast and maybe this september chelsea is just what they need for everybody to stop and saying oh this is what chrysanthemums are like they're not just those little blobs that rather went out of fashion and people were like, oh, pot mums don't like them. Well, that is the problem, you see, because pot mum, I've got a chrysanthemum growing in my garden today, which was given to me as a pot mum. And somebody came years ago and they gave me this pot mum. I was affronted, I have to say, I can't think who the hell it was. No, they're not listening. (laughs) But they gave me this little pot mum and I thought, what ever possessed you to think that I would like a plant like this? It had been sprayed with dwarfing agents. It was this self-conscious Helen, smug it's the thought that thing counts. <laughs> well, yes, that's why I didn't throw it away. I kept it and I planted it in the garden. It was somewhere where I didn't have to walk past very often. And uh, <laughs> it grew. But the following year, of course, it grew to its right size because it, they'd outgrown its dwarfing agent and it grew up to about a metre tall and it had spoon bright yellow spoon shaped petals and I I like it now but I didn't like it then um so you know if you if you're given a pot mum don't think that if you plant it in the garden it's going to stay as it is because it's probably been treated with the hormone treatment to make it grow smaller so you know take your take if you're given a pot mum put it in the garden and hope for the best plant it behind the dustbins first though so you can assess it you know what that was it was like the ugly duckling (laughs) of the gardening world and then the next year it became a swan (laughs) <laughs> exactly and I can understand people being put up at the autumn in the autumn all our garden sh- uh, centers and and farm shops they have those self-conscious little smug dumplings of covered in flower of chrysanthemums well they're not all like that some of them are f- much freer and they're much more branching and if you take a variety like um one of the latest to flower is a great favorite of mine and it's called emperor of china and it has messy kind of petals in a nice mid mid to light pink and as it ages, the foliage goes a wonderful beetroot red. Now that looks lovely in the garden. The only thing against it is it's a rangy old thing and it grows this way, that way, and all the rest of it. Try giving it the Chelsea chop, maybe once, maybe twice. You'll shorten the growth and you'll get it into to being a much more manageable plant. Try it and see. 
And you could try it with other chrysanthemums that grow too tall and Michaelmas daisies and Helleniums and this and that. And <laughs> Just try. Yeah. yeah. Always worth trying. Right then, what's your Flomo, Mr. Gray? Well, my Flomo, because I'm concentrating on alpines, is going to be um, alpines. And I, I would just like to have some of the uh, lesser known, perhaps saxifrages and things like that. Um, I w I'm, I'm going to wait because I don't want to rush out and buy a whole load of them and then find that I can't manage them all or something like that. I'll wait until I'm go I, I sh and I know that I will be somewhere when I see them. I mean, for instance, if you go to visit people's gardens and we've got a very eminent garden coming up, haven't we? Um, we, we could it's crossed. We could actually promote that a little bit if we get the chance, but I think April the 25th this year, Richard and Sally Hobbs, their garden is going to be open to the public. Now, Richard and Sally, they have the National Collection of Muscari, but they also have um, the most wonderful jewel box of a garden with plants that you've probably never heard of yet. Me too. I mean, I, I you know, it's a, it's a wonderful place. And it's the kind of place that I will go to and I'll see something and I think, trough. Yeah. <laughs> they have, just the way they've planted their front garden, there are pulsatillas and wonderful just every kind of wonderful little exquisite jewel box plant that you can imagine they have yeah. scattered around their garden fabulous corydalis as well exactly yes i mean amazing 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 plants i just uh, i can't wait to go and see it it'd be lovely <laughs> uh well uh, we have talked for a very long time uh, the, the thing was we connected up and before we even started the podcast, we talked for ages. So we've been on this call for a very long time, but I've enjoyed every minute of it, Mr. Gray. Miss <laughs> Friedrichs, and so did I. <laughs> I will see you next time with another great guest. But for the time being, happy gardening. Happy gardening, everybody. Bye-bye. Your picture is now very seasonal. Exactly. I thought this morning it'd be rather nice if we, if we, am I too dark? You're a little dark. Oh, you look lovely, darling. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sweetie. <laughs> What's her name? Oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. Bring anything else into it just surprise me. I don't mind. <laughs> surprise? Well, no, you know, I, mean, I, I can talk. <laughs> Never has a true word been spoken. <laughs> <laughs> it's rather, which is quite fortuitous for radio, really, isn't it?